We're now going to move on to the next speaker, Linda Gale Becker, who's going to present on how stigma is impacting on the 1990-90 goals. I'm, I'm sure you all know Linda Gale. She is the Deputy Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV uh, Centre at the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine in Cape Town and the Chief Operating Officer of that foundation. Uh, Linda Gale has a wide range of experience in HIV, tuberculosis and indeed other infectious diseases and of course was the past president President of the International AIDS Society. Linda, we really look forward to hearing from you. How stigma is impacting the 1990-90 goals? Well, we've seen a number of eras in the HIV epidemic in the last 40 years. Certainly at the beginning uh, was huge death and despair, uh, then hope, and we've really seen the epidemic uh, become a chronic a sustained epidemic. More recently, there's been narrative about the end of AIDS. We certainly have come a long way and most pronounced perhaps in the era of treatment, um, antiretrovirals have made a huge difference in terms of how we perceive HIV. Most recently, we've also seen fantastic um, innovation around primary prevention. And happily, um, with the rollout of antiretrovirals, uh, we've seen morbidity and mortality drop around the world. The area we have been less successful in, many would argue, is that of HIV-related stigma, which seems to have evaded us uh, in many ways. We could also argue that of late, if anything, we've seen an exacerbation in stigma and discrimination around the world, as we've also seen the world retreat on human rights uh, in a more wholesale fashion. And this was uh, really highlighted in the International AIDS Society annual letter in 2019. This survey over five years of countries, uh, adults in countries and levels of HIV stigma, how adults perceive people living with HIV and their discriminatory attitudes, you can see really an extraordinary prevalence of these attitudes around the world. So what are the levels of stigma? Um, what kinds of stigma are we talking about? And um, this uh, publication in 2014 nicely describes structural stigma where stigma occurs within social conditions, cultural norms, institutional practices, this notion of public stigma, where commonly held negative beliefs occur in the general population, discrediting a particular group of people. And this inevitably leads to self-stigma, where a person becomes aware of the public stigma and then internalizes the beliefs. And we know discrimination is a direct action that results from stigma. Stigma and discrimination have held the HIV response hostage, particularly where leaders have lacked courage to tackle the questions that would allow for an effective HIV response. Um, we've seen criminalization and discrimination of key populations, criminalization of HIV non-disclosure, exposure or transmission, uh, the lack of implementation of harm reduction approaches, uh, poor service of incarcerated populations, harmful gender norms, gender-based violence, homophobia, um, other beliefs, and inadequate comprehensive sexual health education, to just name a few. So when we think about these populations who are particularly highly burdened, but also, ironically, have the worst access to services. They often fall within the categories of young people, young people who inject drugs and use drugs, people who sell sex, uh, young men who have sex with men, but other populations such as transgender people, incarcerated people, young refugees, migrants, detainees. And so even as we think about leaving no one behind, we are leaving large tracts of the world behind. Most of the infections in uh, the rest of the world, other than East and Southern Africa, uh, occurred in 
key population, 62% of infections. And even in this part of the world, East and Southern Africa, a large part of the new infections were in key populations, almost one third. Why is it uh, that we see more infections in these populations? Well, too often, aside from stigma and prejudice, there's poor information, inadequate services, criminalization, poor social protection, violence, and incarceration. And here you see in this, um, this uh, set of data, uh, looking at HIV incidents amongst MSM in a number of different parts of the world, although incidents were similar. The number of people who knew their status, in other words, had recent testing, was very much dependent on whether their countries criminalized same-sex sex or not. Similarly, uh, we know that harm reduction practices are poorly implemented across the world, um, really leading to unnecessary infections in those parts of the world where uh, drug use is the main cause of HIV. Eastern and Southern Africa see most of their infections in young women and adolescent girls. Um, but even here, we consider them a key population for the reasons that services are inadequate. There are low levels of school completion, inadequate information, high levels of gender-based violence, poor access to services, poor social protection, alongside, of course, stigma and prejudice. And because of these bad policies that reflect more ideology, prejudice and bias, rather than science or evidence, those most vulnerable to HIV are deterred from accessing the services they need the most. So there are targets that are before us, and we, um, you know, talked about these well in advance of 2020 and 2030. Unfortunately, these targets, the 1990-90 targets, we have missed uh, in 2020 in many parts of the world. And the idea here was that if we access 90% of the world for testing, 90% of those who were positive got onto treatment, and 90% of those were virally suppressed, we would see a consequent reduction in HIV new infections. But hand in glove to that, of course, is the recognition this cannot be attained unless we also do something about stigma and discrimination. And here you see the goal for 2020 was zero discrimination. We have, of course, fallen short of that. So what has been the impact of that not meeting that goal on the 1990-90 targets? Well, we know that whilst we have made some gains, the progress is well off the mark. And 62% uh, of new infections occurred in key populations where people struggle to access sexual reproductive health services, many are criminalized, um, and many face a great deal of stigma because of that criminalization. And so as we look at the whole um, cascade, we know that stigma and discrimination plays a role in every single aspect of the cascade, all the way from demand creation, encouraging health-seeking behavior, all the way through to actually retention in care and viral suppression. And so in this publication from UNAIDS, now somewhat dated, 2005, much of what was said about stigma and discrimination still holds fast. So where on that cycle of the cascade, we know uh, stigma plays a significant role. And I draw your attention to this document. Uh, it is online. And that particular graphic, uh, which shows just the places where uh, stigma and discrimination plays a significant role um, in, uh, in the cascade. So let's turn to the first 90. And we know that stigma can drive lower rates of uptake of testing. Uh, there are several interventions that can address that. And chief among them are knowledge. So by increasing knowledge, we can trigger changes to stigmatizing attitudes. Knowledge and attitude improvements can trigger changes in behavior, 
with increased HIV uptake. It is interesting also this paper from TARP and others in 2018 conclude that knowledge alone can lead to testing uptake even when it doesn't necessarily change stigmatizing attitudes and behaviors. Not to forget other biomedical interventions such as self-testing which of course can combat stigma and here a paper in uh, by Perez and, uh, and others showing that uh, the power of self testing, uh, being able to test alone, how that can also uh, reduce fear of community stigmatization um, and, uh, and enable people to test. So there may be other ways uh, to tackle this problem. We know uh, that stigma can compromise adherence to HIV treatment um, and in this paper um, an important one, looking at what were some of the roles uh, of stigma in undermining ART adherence. And public stigma can play a role here, where adaptive coping and social support processes are undermined. Structural stigma can play a role, uh, really, again, where a person living with HIV is unable to overcome structural and economic barriers associated with poverty due to stigma. And then finally, of course, self-stigma playing a very significant role, undermining an individual's recognition that life-saving treatment is, is really key to their well-being. And then uh, the third 90, that, one, that of viral suppression, staying in care and making sure that antivirals are taken regularly can be undermined. And here, healthcare facilities themselves can play a very significant role. So this paper that I highlight here helps uh, us to think through ways that healthcare facilities can reduce their discriminatory practices, uh, reduce stigma, and enable people to stay in care and to take their antivirals regularly. So that may include increasing information, uh, sensitizing healthcare workers, bringing in peer-led uh, programs, allowing for coping mechanisms, and bringing about structural change, which really raises the question of differentiated care. And we know that differentiated care, differentiated service delivery, does address stigma. In order to be client-centered, we have to overcome stigmatization. And, and this becomes a very important uh, concept all the way through the whole cascade. Um, so again, reminding you that differentiated care goes all the way from prevention through to viral suppression. Viral suppression, of course, can be a destigmatizing concept. So ironically, although stigma can affect the third 90, the third 90 can cycle back to reduce stigma. And we know that individuals who are virally suppressed are uninfectious and this can certainly help with self-stigma, but it can also help if we educate healthcare workers and others can be a very important factor to help those individuals overcome um, a lot of discrimination and stigma that exists in, in the world today. So it really becomes a, a full cycle. So in my last couple of minutes, here are some other approaches that we can learn from other health domains such as substance use and mental illness to bring into the HIV arena uh, to say what can we do. Well of course for adolescents it's very important to start at the very fundamental level, school-based programs and also social media, the internet, increasing knowledge and understanding uh, to reduce stigma. Education at the heart of this, misinformation, uh, countering inaccurate stereotypes with factual evidence can be really important. Um, what about protests and advocacy? Of course, advocacy, advancing civil rights, formally rejecting stigma, very important. And this speaks to grassroots movements. Um, the need to reduce social distance, a difficult one to discuss at this time of COVID, but there are other ways of reducing social distance using social media, for instance. Uh, making contact uh, very important. Again, doesn't have to be physical contact. It can be done virtually. And then peer-led, peer services 
a really critical way to address some of these stigma issues. So um, interesting ways uh, for us to think those through. Two documents I've already uh, alerted you to the now somewhat dated UNAIDS document that I think still holds true, uh, but also bringing home this annual letter that was written by the International AIDS Society in 2019, where its uh, last page really documents some concrete agenda items for all of us, uh, alerting you to the Global Partnership for Action to eliminate stigma, the roles that governments can play, uh, the need for new funding, uh, prioritization of stigma mitigation, uh, the role that healthcare workers can play, and of course the role that people living with HIV themselves can play, but we cannot rely on, on people living with HIV alone. It is worth saying in the last few seconds that stigma reduction efforts remain chronically underfunded, and of course this is something to bring home in 2020. Community mobilization information needs funding, interpersonal communication, so key civil support, civil society support and peer-led programs all need to be effectively funded. We are making gains in the general population, but there is a great, great risk that we are leaving large tracts of key populations behind. Uh, and this is because of fragile, underfunded, fragmented, stigmatizing, and inefficient health systems. John Cohen uh, penned this important piece in 2018, and I would just say that the AIDS epidemic is far from um, over. We will not reach the UNAIDS targets and control HIV unless we end HIV-related stigma. There are many parts of the world where stigma continues unabated, and in those places, the epidemic is far from over. With that, I would just acknowledge uh, my research assistant, Carrie Pike, um, and these two very important documents, as well as many other research uh, uh, materials which I did highlight through the talk. Thank you for listening.